Hello, I'm Hart Mountain Wyoming Foundation Executive Director Dakota Roslin, and I hope that you've been enjoying our online programs this week. Uh, this week we have specifically focused on Japanese culture inside of the camps, and particularly the story of the Issei generation. Uh, you'll hear us toss around a lot of terms in these programs, uh, two of them especially, Issei and Nisei. Uh, these are the two main generations of Japanese Americans affected by the incarceration. The Issei are the immigrant generation who left Japan and came to the United States. And then the Nisei are their children who were born and raised here in the United States. Even though the Nisei make up the largest number of people in camp, just over 60%, uh, the story of the Issei is really fascinating and we cannot discount their contributions because they're really the ones who faced the worst discrimination when they came to the United States, and they are also the ones who are responsible for building a Japanese American community here in the US. So to get this story started, you really can't just begin with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. If you're going to talk about how the camps came to be, you've got to go all the way back to the first arrivals of Japanese immigrants in the United States. And this all starts in the 1880s with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, this is a law that was passed in 1882 that barred Chinese laborers from entering into the United States. This had been championed for years and years by white nativist groups, especially on the West Coast, who since the 1840s had really been complaining about the growing number of Chinese immigrants to the US. Uh, they specifically argued that these Chinese laborers were stealing American jobs and American wages that otherwise could go to white workers. And so they were finally successful in reaching their goals in the 1880s, uh, but a surprising thing happened after this act was passed. With a sudden absence of Chinese workers, uh, there were no sudden huge waves of white workers to come in and fill these low paying jobs, mostly in tough industries that required hard manual labor, mostly in mining, in the railroad, and then in agriculture. And so, Employers in the United States were faced with a labor shortage and they started to actively look for workers from Japan to come and fill these roles. And so within just a few years of the Chinese Exclusion Act, you had a huge number of Japanese immigrants that were being actively courted to come to the United States and immigrating here for better possibilities. A great example of this here in Wyoming is in Rock Springs. In 1885, there was a huge wave of violence against uh, Chinese miners that resulted in uh, white nativists attacking Chinatown and killing 28 men and burning the entirety of the Chinatown in Rock Springs to the ground. That's shocking on its own, but another amazing part of that story is that within a year, Japanese immigrants moved in and rebuilt on the top of uh, the old Chinatown and had taken over all of those mining jobs. And so the speed at which this happens really uh, cannot be imagined in some cases. Thousands of young men in Japan took advantage of this opportunity to immigrate to the United States. A lot of them had been economically or politically disenfranchised as imperial power had started to grow in Japan toward the end of the 19th century there. And so really in even just the first 20 years or so of the 20th century, you had over 100,000 Japanese immigrants to the United States. At first, it was mostly young men who were seeking to earn some money. A lot of them planned to uh, make their fortune in the United States and go back to Japan and uh, decided that they liked it here after a while. And so eventually they sent back uh, for uh, wives for themselves, uh, the so-called picture brides uh, that they would correspond with and then bring to the United States. And so they started to raise families here in the United States. And they went from just being laborers in the mines or uh, on the farms to actually owning their own farms and businesses and having kids and starting neighborhoods like Little Tokyo in Los Angeles or Japantown in San Francisco. And so they really uh, started to develop their own sense of community and identity within the United States. And unfortunately, that's when the backlash against them started. 
By the 1920s, the same groups of nativists that had forced a lot of the Chinese immigrants out were targeting Japanese Americans. Uh, some of the first laws that they put on books were the alien land laws on the West Coast that actually uh, stopped the Issei generation from owning land. Uh, and so a lot of Issei farmers, for instance, would put their farms in the name of their children of the Nisei generation who, because they were born in the United States, actually had birthright citizenship and so were citizens. The Issei could not become citizens, and that went for anybody from an Asian country. Uh, they could not even go through the process of being naturalized. They wouldn't get that right until the 1950s. And so the laws only grew more and more discriminatory from there until finally in 1924, uh, the Immigration Act of 1924 is passed, and that forbids immigration from any Asian country to the United States. And so that's really when the flow of Japanese immigrants stops completely. Uh, but by that time, they had already built a fairly large community, especially on the West Coast. By 1940, there were about 140,000 Japanese Americans living in the United States, and about 120,000 of them were concentrated there on the West Coast. By the 1930s, relations between the United States and Japan had become rather tense. And the Issei actually bore a lot of the brunt of this uh, because the American government came to be very suspicious of them. And in fact, the FBI had started to assemble a list in the 1930s of all of the Issei within the United States that they considered to be suspicious in some way. Um, now, some of these folks did have connections to the Japanese government or they were still uh, working with businesses in Japan. But there were other people, uh, Buddhist priests, uh, you had Japanese language school teachers who had very uh, basic connections to Japanese culture, but were still targeted because of that. And they are really the first to be affected by the incarceration because right after Pearl Harbor is bombed, the FBI starts going around and picking up men that are on this list. And so they are really the first ones to be incarcerated there. The Issei, not being citizens, have very few rights. They were resident aliens up until the war started, and when the war happened, they became enemy aliens. And so the government had a lot of leeway with what they could do to them. Uh, eventually, of course, all of the Japanese American population is incarcerated, that's living on the West Coast. And uh, even within the camps, the Issei face a good deal of discrimination, uh, especially when they want to uh, practice their cultural traditions, you know, uh, when they want to have their Buddhist church services, when they want to uh, perform Japanese theater or write Japanese poetry. The administration of the camps is very suspicious and lays down uh, pretty strict regulations to guide this. But it is these cultural survivals. It is the way that the Issei were sort of able to bridge Japanese culture with American identity that goes such a long way in creating a Japanese American community. And you got to remember that the government at this time was trying to eradicate any kind of uh, uh, Japanese cultural survival from this group of people because they considered that to be dangerous and insidious in some way. But it was the Issei who really stood up and made sure that some of these things were preserved even inside of the tightly regulated uh, camps here. And so they really deserve a lot of credit for being able to preserve Japanese American identity throughout this time. The Issei, in a lot of ways, faced the worst of what America had to offer. Almost from the beginning of their arrival, they faced discrimination, uh, they faced disenfranchisement, but they kept at it because they believed in the possibilities of American democracy. And they know that maybe they'd never be able to take full advantage of that but they believed that their kids would be able to take part in that, that as American citizens, they would be able to enjoy much freer rights and they would have access to much better lives in the future. And so because of that possibility, even with all they faced, the Issei kept fighting. And that's why it's important that we take time out to recognize their contributions to this story. Thanks for joining us this week, and we'll see you next week with a new round of online programs.